hey, what's going on? Welcome back. Uh, today, I thought I'd dive into um, APIs. I thought uh, it might be interesting for some folks to figure out how to integrate uh, an API with Unreal Engine Blueprints. Uh, so I'm going to use a, I think, a more common use case. There is a tool called Replica Studios that uh, uh, can be used to basically generate AI uh, character voices. So I'll just show how this thing uh, works really quickly. Um, you can pick an actor voice. They've got a whole bunch of um, actors in their portfolio. Uh, you can pick one of them. I'm gonna try and pick one that's not a beta. We'll select this guy, Atlas. You can type in some dialogue. Hey, you tubers. How are you? Okay, uh, there's a whole bunch of different uh, styles that you can um, work with, uh, but we're just gonna save the take and then we're going to uh, download, uh, or actually we're gonna play it. Hey, you two bus, how are you? Right, so it's, uh, it's computer generated uh, audio, text to speech, and like I said, that's the general use case for it. The cool thing is that they uh, have also included an API where you can integrate into this and pull out um, uh, the audio that you want and uh, store it to flat files on your system. And so I thought that would be a neat use case to demonstrate um, integrating with in Unreal Engine. I assume for the most part, if you're watching this video, you probably already know what an API is. But if we do have uh, people that aren't sure, it's a programmable interface. So basically, all that means is that, um, for example, Replica has their own set of code on their own servers, and they execute that code to generate the speech that I just showed you in their application. What an API does is it'll expose certain pieces of their programming um, out to what are called endpoints. And then from a separate application, you can reach out to those endpoints and access whatever they're making available. In this case, um, they're going to make, uh, I think five or six endpoints available where you can ask them to generate a, um, uh, an AI voice, and then um, they'll provide you with a file that you can pull down in that AI voice rather than uh, using their application directly. Okay, so uh, I just brought up a clip from a previous tutorial that I made where I was demoing the functionality of the API. I'll put a link in the description below for this. But what I've got on the screen now is I just got uh, some basic um, UI widgets where it's taking in uh, the different information from the user. It's then passing it out to the Replica API and you're seeing the, the results. What a great day to be alive. What a great day to be alive. So we'll close out of there. Um, we'll go to their main website here and under products, replica API. Uh, maybe it was just under resources API docs. Um, you can come here and they basically explain how uh, the API is working. Um, all of their examples use, um, what the heck is the name of the application? Uh, use this Postman application. Uh, to sort of prove out how to uh, set up and use the API. Um, so I would encourage you to set Postman up um, and follow their documentation here. Um, I've already set it up. Uh, once you have it working, you can have your auth the authentication set up, your uh, get of the voice, your get of the speech, um, and then there's a couple of different other options there. Um, but that's essentially what they're talking about when uh, they're talking about Postman. Really, um, for our use case, I mean, you don't need it other other than to sort of prove that you can get it to work from your system using the Postman app and their directions. I'm going to show you how to set it up in Unreal Engine, and we may refer back to um, some of the code that's in Postman to show you how I figured some of this stuff out. Um, the other thing that they've got in their documentation is along the top, they've got, uh, what is this, five different um, script types. Um, so if you were to click on a specific script type, for example, HTTP, and then scroll down to the different endpoints that are on the API, 
it's got the code samples that you're going to need um, based on the type of API that uh, you're using. So this is all the HTTP, HTTP uh, scripting for each one of the um, endpoint calls that you can make to their API. Well, let's get started in an Unreal uh, application. I'm going to be using 427, so I would recommend uh, you do the same, but this should work in um, all the other versions as well. Okay, so let's just pick a new game. That's fine. Um, we can do a blank template. That is also fine. And then we won't need ray tracing or any of this other stuff. Um, this is all fine. And what we can do is we can call this my replica API. And then this one, my replica API. Okay. Okay, so for this to work, we're gonna need a couple of things. We're gonna need some uh, plugins. And so I'm just gonna uh, launch the uh, marketplace here and we'll look for the plugins that we need. I'll actually show you in my library here. So in the installed plugins, actually I'll show you on uh, 426 is where I use this last. Um, you can click on installed uh, plugin. So if you go to library, the version, I've got all these versions installed, but the version that you're using, uh, if you click on installed plugins, it shows you all the different plugins that you have installed. What we need is we need this VA rest plugin and we need this runtime files uh, downloader. So VA rest and runtime files downloader. I'm just going to confirm that I have those in uh, 427, which I do. Runtime files, uh, downloader, and uh, VA REST. So perfect. Um, and I'll just show you on the marketplace <clears throat> where you can grab those. What is going on here? There you go. VA REST, it's free. Just go and grab that one. Run on files download. There you go. This guy also free. So grab both of those. Um, and you should be good to go. I'm going to go with those downloaded. I'm going to go into my plugins and I'm going to look for both of them. So runtime files downloader. I'm going to enable that It's going to ask me to restart. But since we're restarting, we may as well get all of our plugins. There we go. And restart now. So now both of those plugins are going to be enabled in our project. And because we're not going to do a whole lot with this project, I'm actually just going to go up to here, settings, um, sorry, up to blueprints and um, open the level blueprint, the level blueprint. And that way we don't have to uh, create a separate um, sort of blueprint class and whatnot. It's already created for us. And this type of functionality is generic. So we're going to be running it from the generic blueprint anyways. I think that makes sense. Um, so we'll do it from there. We're going to, uh, let's just use the one key. We'll just right click and we'll put in one. And we just need something to drive uh, this, right? So a keyboard event is fine. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to set up the username and password, right? So I guess what we want to do is we probably want to uh, create an, a widget to enter the password, but I'm just thinking maybe we'll hold off on that for now and we'll just um, default set a couple of text variables for this for now and then we'll add a, a widget later. Um, so let's just say user name, password, and then we'll just change this to um, a string. And this one will change to a string as well. Okay, so off of this, so VA REST, and then there should be like a VA REST subsystem or something. Get VA REST subsystem. So this, um, uh, this element will allow us to drive all of the blueprint nodes that we need. So uh, when I was trying to type in the construct uh, JSON request, 
it's got to come from uh, this guy here. So then uh, on pressing one, using the VA REST subsystem, you can construct a JSON request. And the first one that we want to do is we want to do a post. Um, and I just want to make sure uh, we want to request uh, body. And then uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to promote this to a variable. And I call this guy uh, JSON post request so that we can manage that. Um, and then I'm going to bind event to on request complete. That's just saying, you know, when this um, request has been completed, um, we can create a custom event to trigger once the uh, request has been completed. So I'm just going to do custom event. Uh, and then we'll just call this authentication rest callback. Okay. So basically this custom event will execute when this request is completed and then we can run uh, additional code off of there. Um, we also want to have a separately bind event to on request fail. So we want to know when the request fails. And we'll just drive that in line. And then uh, we're also going to have another custom event here. No, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tie them together for now. You could have your separate events, but I think there's an opportunity to share the code. So we'll just drive it into the same event and then we'll just manage that later. Uh, that's fine. Okay. Cool. Um, now what else do we want to do here? Right. So we want to also here, um, we want to get request object. Boom. Run that down here. And then on this one, we want to set string field. Okay. So this is where we're going to put in our uh, username. And then the field name, this is going to be the client ID. And again, referring back to uh, Postman, you can see that it needs in this um, uh, JSON object, right, with the post command, it needs a client ID and a secret ID, right? So this one's going to be the client ID. And then uh, we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to, again, set string field. And then we're going to call this one uh, secret. And then the string value is going to be your password. So on these, uh, because I don't want to share my username and password with you, all that you need to do is hit compile and save, whoops, or sorry, compile. And then um, you can now edit the default uh, value of the username and the password. So just go in there and enter in your actual username for Replica Studios and your password for Replica Studios. Um, and then those will be passed along. That request object. Sorry, my bad. I'm referring to my uh, other code here and I'll try and explain it as I go along, but I haven't looked at this for a while, so I'm literally just kind of following along here. Okay, so we've got our JSON object and we need the post request here. So we need this yeah, post request again and we need to drive that in there. So your target is your post request and your JSON object is the JSON object uh there right so that's the two and then uh we need to process the url off of that boom we can keep that the same you to line those up and then this is the url that we need so the url is going to be the replica uh <laughs> replica replica studios um api URL. So in here, I have it here. 
and um, we would be able to see the same thing in our replica studios documentation uh, right here you can see the post of the URL so that's all that we're jamming into this uh, post URL there you go cool so that's right um, and then uh, that would be all the code to sort of create the um, uh, the JSON request and to post um, the request to uh, Replica Studios. And then essentially um, this is looking to monitor, does this entire request, does it complete or does it fail, right? And so uh, basically we would end up here and we would wanna get the response object. Okay, and this we can uh, get the field names. And we'd also want to get the string field tool. And this is going to be the access token. Okay, um, and let me just see if I can tie that. Whoops, I keep hitting save. Anyway. Well, you know what, I should save it. Save, um, we'll call this uh, API integration. Um, yeah, so if I went back to the endpoints here, um, here, this is what we're getting, right? We're getting this access token. This is essentially going to be our token that keeps the session alive while we're communicating um, with the API. So to make sure that um, the API doesn't mix up requests, like if I connect to the API at the same time that you connect to Replica, how does it know, uh, how does it keep straight? who's accessing what, and how do I know, if you've authenticated with a username and password, how do I make sure that, you know, the information that I'm, that you're requesting is being sent to you? That's this access token, or these bear tokens that are going to uh, persist through your integration in the API, and uh, make sure that you have a unique ID so that um, while you're talking to the API, it knows, um, it knows who you are and that you're authenticated. Uh, so we are going to, I just made, you know, oh yeah, uh, we're going to get a copy. I always forget between reference and copy. I think those words are way too similar. Anyways, we're going to get a copy. This changes then don't go back to the array. We're not making changes to the original array. We're just getting copies. Okay. So we want to get the two elements out of, uh, the array. Let's just do this. Get array field. All right. And we'll do that twice. Get array field. And then essentially from these, we can go here. We can go here. So those field names, right, are uh, the fields that we have there. There, that's kind of clean. Okay. Um, we could, uh, if we want print string, you know what, we might as well put these print strings in because we're probably going to mess something up. So this will be able to tell us what we're doing. Um, here, this is again, right, the field name. And uh, we'll do another one. There we go. Um, we have those field names printing out. Um, get copy. Get copy. Okay, and these arrays are different because they're inputs into them. The field names are different. And then um, we want to do this as string. Thing as string. And then we're going to do some more printing. So print string. We want to put the string in. Let's just change the color at this point so we know it's something a little bit different. Okay. 
So the return value, if this fails, is um, bad credentials. And I don't think that's, is it in the documentation here? No, I don't think it's in the documentation. I think this was just um, me playing around uh, and putting in, like trying this, uh, making it fail, and then seeing what the output was from the API. So what I found was that if you get this array field and it returns the exact value bad credentials, um, then that's when you can determine if the credentials are, are bad. And then uh, what I did is I just promoted this to a variable and I put um, authentication pass. Um, and then I just set that in there. And then uh, I also did a print string. And then I put this guy in there. I'll show you everything that's going on here. And then um, we also need this string field over here. So this guy. And then I also want to set this um, remote this to a variable as an access token. Oops, access token. Yeah. Cool. And yeah, I want to set that guy in there. Guy down, we'll change this guy's color to pink too. Cool, okay. No other way around, there we go. Okay, uh, then we're setting the access token. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna run a branch off of here. Branch, branch. And this is where we're gonna get the authentication passed and make sure that it's true, right? That just happened over here, right? So if, if it doesn't equal bad credentials, um, then, uh, right, so if it's true, we're gonna say uh, another print string. And then here, we're just gonna say authentic authentication failed. And we'll turn that uh, red. Instead of pulling in text for now, we'll just create another um, string. And we'll call this uh, text to speech block um, and this one we can this is where we'll hard code whatever we want to pull back from replica to studio so this is a test out to replica and so that's what uh, the the voice file that we'll get back it, it'll say that um, we could create a GUI and have the person enter it but for now just for testing purposes we'll just do this for now okay so then um, the next thing we want to do is that's going to do our authentication. I like to break these up. So I'm going to put in another keyboard event and we'll just keep it simple with two. And then what we're going to do is from this VA uh, REST subsystem, we are going to do our JSON get request. So we're going to do construction, uh, construct, construct JSON uh, request, right. And that's gonna be here. So when we press two, it'll do this. It'll be a get request and um, form yeah, the URL, that's fine. Okay, so then this one, we're gonna promote to a variable again. We're gonna call this 
Um, JSON get request. And then uh, we're going to go through similar uh, type exercise to on event to on request complete. And then we'll do the on fail. And I'll just stop quickly and show you. So this is the authentication. It's passed. The next one is we need to um, get the voice and we need to uh, get the speech that we're going to use. So essentially, we got to say, hey, what voice actor do we want to use? And then what, um, what speech do we want to call? And what's the sample rate and all that sort of stuff. So here's all the different stuff. Um, and then uh, I don't use the long polling um, here. So those are the ones that we're going to use. Okay. So we are constructing this um, get object. So we can pull this off, get request object. There we go. Bind that in there. We can find event. Oops. Event to on request fail. And then same thing, I'm just going to use one, one custom event. And we'll call this rest JSON get request response. Uh, response object. There you go. Okay, let's just keep going with this. So, uh, response object. Uh, we need to tie this event in there when it's completed. We'll clean this up a little. Uh, there, looks good. Okay. Um, we need to set the header uh, of this request. The target is going to remain the same. The header name is going to be authorization. And you got to be careful, make sure that you're putting in um, the right values there. So again, flying back to the documentation. Here you go. Uh, authorization header, right? So that's why we're putting that in. Or conversely, if you did go through the process of um, playing around with uh, Playing around with Postman, you can see here, uh, uh, header is authorization. Okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, header names, authorization. The value is going to be our access token that we created previously, right? So we got um, the response back, and where did we store that? We stored that here, right? So on our response object in the access token field, um, we pulled out uh, the access token, and that's now going to be our authorization token, right? So this is confirming that because we're sending a separate request here, right? We send an initial request. These requests are going to happen at different times. We now sent this request, and this is authorizing us or saying that, hey, we already have this token uh, from you, so you know who we are. Um, so uh, there is another step that has to happen here, though, right? So um, we need an append. And because this isn't on its own, what we need to do is we need to uh, append uh, this bearer with a space, I believe, in front. Yeah. Uh, we need to append bearer with a space and then our access token. And that'll actually be our complete uh, header value. And I believe uh, that's this, right? Authorization, bearer, and then um, the token. So see, there's a space there. So that's why it's going to need that bearer space. And then the, ac um, uh, and then the uh, actual access token. Okay. Um, 
Next, we're finally using uh, this guy to set request object. Um, we'll do that and we'll bring them up here. And then, so the requesting object is again going to be our uh, JSON get request. We established over there. Put them in. Boom. Okay. And then, um, what else do we got going on here? We have. I'm just looking because we did a few things a little bit differently. Okay, I'll just stay on along the top for now. So um, this is going to uh, have a print string, which we'll um, funnel in a sec. And then uh, we're going to have the process URL, uh, but it needs a target. Uh, JSON get request process URL. There we go. Okay. So yeah, we need to, I believe, get this text to speech block. And then we need to uh, reformat it. So uh, we need a replace. And anything with a blank, we need to convert from a blank. And we actually need to insert that blank in here. So you need to hit space. And then here we need to put percent um, 20. Okay. And the reason that we're doing that is if we go back to our documentation again, this is why. So in the get, we actually, it, this is how it's formulated. It says speech question mark text equals and then everywhere there's supposed to be a, a, a space, the formatting is percent 20. So basically what we need to do is we either need to originally put this in as percent 20s, um, or we need to replace every spa space. So conceivably, um, especially if you're going to expose this to the user in a, in a blueprint widget, you're not gonna ask them to put percent 20 instead of spaces. So we would do that for them, right? So this, you can put whatever your text is in normal format, and then we can reformat it based on what the actual API needs, if that all makes sense. Okay, um, cool. What else? This can actually slide down. Um, and then this can go up this way. Okay, I don't like the way that looks, so let's just this. Okay, so format, make sure again, make sure that you actually did put in the space there. So you can see if I put the arrow keys, the space is there. And then no space is just percent 20. And so that's going to convert that string into the format that we need. And then what we can do is we can append. Um, and we are going to need uh, this URL that I was showing you in the documentation. Uh, we're going to need all of this. And all the way up to equals. I'm just going to copy that out. And essentially, we've got to put that in here. Um, and then we put our newly formatted string uh, at the end. And then um, the next piece we do is we go and speaker whoops, and speaker ID equals. And then um, what we can do is we can add another pin here and we can promote this to variable. And we would call this uh, not that but we would call this something different. We would call this replica speaker ID. Cool. And then uh, let's just queue these up. Cool. Actually, let's do that again. 
that down. Bring that down like that. Okay. Um, okay, so let me just explain this last part. Um, but if you look, it's got our text, and then at the end it has and speaker ID equals, and then uh, uh, a value there, right? Um, okay, cool. Um, so that's all working, except we don't have anything in the speaker ID. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna copy this value over here, um, but essentially, each one of these, uh, where's my replica? Oh, did I close it? Let me show you. Each one of these speakers has an ID. And if you really wanted to kind of expand the, uh, the API, you could go and you could get all the speakers and you could then select, have your user select them, all that sort of stuff. But this is what it's talking about. When you select a voice, Right, you have all these different speakers, and so each one of them is going to have a uh, speaker ID. Okay, so let's do this. We're talking about all the different voice actors that are available. Why don't we actually um, dive into it? I haven't done this before in another project, but why don't we actually go and get all the different voice variable types and pull in the UUIDs and let the user select what UUID uh, they want to use? So how do we do that? Um, I, I spent about 30 minutes or so figuring out how this all works. And so I added a, a third event, but what I'll do is I'll remove this and we'll basically copy it over and I'll walk you through how we did that. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to back up here to the first event that we created on number one. And I think I did a decent job of walking you guys through what's happening when we're calling the authentication request, but maybe I didn't explain in greater detail what's happening um, when we get a response back, right? So we're basically, we're posting a JSON request. We're um, uh, sending them some values over to the API in a specific format. We're uh, creating our request object, and then we're posting it to the URL that uh, is available for the API, okay? And then basically these two events are ha handling on request complete or on request fail, handle the response back, right? So in the API, API call, we're going out to that website, uh, we're going out to that URL, we're sending information in that URL, and then after that's complete, we're getting a response back. So this is the response section. How do we understand the response a little bit better? Well, there's this little function, if I pull this off of here, and I say, um, get response, content as string. I think this will do a good job of explaining a little bit in more detail what's happening. So let's do this. Uh, actually, let's print a string here. Print string. Uh, let's cut this one off and let's just pump in the string. And then we'll choose a different color. Let's just pick like an orangey color. And we will pick uh, 60 seconds. So it stays on our screen uh, for a minute, so it doesn't go away. Okay, now if I uh, compile and save, and I run that, I'm just gonna hit one. Uh, you can see what's printed out to the screen. Uh, we have a curly brace, then we have access token, then we have a big long alphanumeric um, string, and then we have another uh, refresh token, and then another alphanumeric uh, string, and then uh, close of the curly brace. So that's the data that we're getting back from the API in a string format. Well, how do we make sense of that? So if we go back to the code that we're running, we're essentially using this get response object. So that's the response from the API. And then we're running two different things on top of it. So the first thing that I ran was get field names. So if we go back to our an example, um, yeah, so this here, the access token, this is the uh, field name. And this refresh token is the field name. And then this is the value that's tied to that field name. So all that I had done here previously was I was getting the field names to understand what are our options. Um, so you actually don't need a lot of this code. This was really just printing it out to the screen, out to the screen so that we could better understand the API. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm, while we're here, I'm actually going to remove a lot of this. We don't need the field names. Uh, we don't need the 
field array. Oh, actually, we do need this for bad credentials. Never mind. I'm going to leave that in. But we don't need these two print strings then. We can just leave that. I'll just run that here. We're using bad credentials off of this one. Um, and technically, we don't need this guy either. So really, we don't need this whole second field because we're not using the refresh token at all. I'm just going to delete this. There we go. So that's really the, only the code that we need. So I'll leave that in there. And you can see how this all works. We'll pull this all back. Cool. I don't mind that. I'll leave that as is. Okay. And I'm going to delete this. Okay. Uh, so where was I? Yeah, so we have the string, we printed that out. Okay, so essentially what we're doing is we're getting the response object, we're pulling out the field name, and then based on that field name, we're getting the array field, um, which is that alphanumeric portion of the uh, response object. So we got the name, and then the input that we need to get the array field is to tell it what name. Are we going to get the access token, or are we going to get the refresh token? Yeah, and then down here we're getting the string field so it's just a different way to get the value out of there and we want the one specifically that is access token um, so the reason that that we have these two options is because i coupled the bind request fail and the on request complete um, together right so in the request uh, complete it's going to follow this path and on the request fail it's essentially we need this to see if it's called bad credentials that's all that that um, that's all that's happening there. Okay, cool. So I think now that we understand that a little bit better, um, that might be helpful. Okay, so I'm going to delete this out of here. We don't need to actually get the response object as a string. That was really just to help us understand what was happening here. Okay, so fast forward to what we've done here. We're going to use the um, voice we're going to use the voice API. So let me cut this off and I'll slide this code down. And what we can do is we can potentially refer to it um, so I can rebuild it for you. Uh, so essentially we want to do almost exactly the same as we did uh, in the previous example. So we want to construct JSON object or JSON request. We're making a request out to the API. We want to drive that from the three value. We want that to be uh, a get and request body. Okay, so it's just matching. Oh, actually, we want it to be a URL. I don't know why I put request body. Um, we want it to match uh, this guy up here. Okay, and then the same thing that we did up here, where we set the JSON get request, uh, we bound all the events, we set the header. All this stuff we actually want to copy and uh, put here. We could combine this all into a function because we're running uh, essentially the same thing. But uh, for this example, I think we're only doing two. So I'll have two separate things here. But we could create variables and basically run a function and um, have a little bit of cleaner code. But for this, we'll just walk through it and we'll make it happen. OK. Um, so this is setting the get request. Uh, let's just see if there's anything. So set the, the get request into the variable where you're using the same variable. We want to bind on request complete, request fail. Um, we want to set the header. We want to set request object and we want to process the URL. You'll notice that the URL is slightly different on this one. The, oh, I haven't updated this one yet. But this one is going to be the voice URL that we get out of here. Here's your URL that we're um, processing. Uh, the header name is going to be the same, author authorization. And then we're going to be uh, inputting the bear token. So that's all going to be the same. That's why we copied that code over. Okay. And then the response is where things are going to change a little bit. So um what we want to do is we want to create uh, an event so this one i called race uh, ray race Re rest json get request um, and i'll actually change that name to uh speech because that's the this one we're um 
constructing the speech. And then th this one, we will do a custom event and we will call it the exact same, except we'll call it uh, voice. Okay. Cool. And then, um, yeah. So then at this point, this is where things got a little bit dicey for me. So if you remember on the, uh, the, the authentication request, we got a response object. Well, I went and I followed the same uh, line of thinking and I got a response object. But the problem was is that response object kept coming up blank. And so what I did is I then uh, did this. I said get response content as string. And uh, just like we did earlier, print string. And I printed this out to the screen. We'll make this 60 seconds. Pull this down so we're not jammed in our code there. Okay. And if I compile and save this, what's it complaining about? Oh, right. Okay, no problem. Let's plug that in there as well. Compile and save this. Um, and if I go to our project and I hit play, I have to hit one. Three won't work on its own. If I hit three on its own, it's just going to fail, right? Authorization header is invalid, exception unauthorized. Um, so if I, uh, it's going to fail because we don't have uh, an authentication request set up and we don't have a bare token. So now if I hit one, you'll see. Uh, that went through fine. And now if I hit three, uh, you'll see that we get a uh, supply of objects. But the difference here uh, is that instead of just having uh, a curly brace and then a couple of options, we actually have multiple sets of curly braces. And so what we want to do is we want to get this response object in here. This whole thing is a response object. But really what we have is we have an array of um, response objects, whereas last time we just got a single object returned to us that we could manipulate. Um, so that's why I was running into problems. So the way to work around that, at least in Unreal, is um, this. So uh, we don't need this because we understand. Well, you know what? I'll leave it because I may refer to it again to explain a few things, but we don't need this. Um, so what we're going to do is instead of getting a response object, we're going to get a response value. So let's drive this off of here, response value. And from the response value, we're going to treat it as an array, JSON as an array, because essentially that's what it is, right? We have an array of a whole bunch of objects. And then um, what we would have to do is now that we have that in an array, we can pump out each one of these, right? So if I got a copy, so for an, an, our example here, we're only going to get value zero, but um, we could, here I'll just do this just so that we know, um, we could get the length of the array as well. I'll do that just to kind of show. Okay, so we're going to get the first object and we're going to get the length of the array. And then um, just to demonstrate what's going on here, I am going to print string both of those things out. So we will do an append and we will do four pins. And we're going to say um, first, first array value colon space. Uh, this thing. And then we'll put the length in there and we'll say array length space. Okay. And I think actually I have to do more to this one. I just realized because um, that's just going to get the name of our object and we actually want more than that. So let's pump this down this way. Pull this here. And then um, I think as object, yeah, as object. I want to take the value of um, yeah, we want to take the value out of here. We want to treat it as a JSON object. 
And then we want to do what we did before, get the field names and get the string field. So, um, or we can just get the string field. So, um, uh, here, let's do this here. Get field names. Get string field. Okay. Um, and then this one's going to be name, and this is going to be. Yeah, we might as well get all of them. So for each loop here, I'll just copy this. So, uh, you know what, I'll just do it. Um, so for each loop, for each value in this array, put this down, uh, print out the element. That's the body, and then when it's completed, execute this print string, which is going to be the um, first array value, right? So this guy is, that's the array length, and then this one is going to be name, and we'll show why that's the case there, okay. Let's compile and save this and see what happens. So hit play, hit one, uh, one's complete, now hit three. So there you go. So, oh, I didn't, uh, I didn't put those for a meaningful amount of time. Uh, let's pump all of these up to 60 and 60, and let's just change the colors. Keep us organized a little bit. Boom, boom, okay. I'll save and let's play this out. So one to connect three, and then here's what we got. So uh, you can see here was our initial string. And then basically what we did is we uh, grabbed the first object and then we said, print out the name fields. Well, the name fields are UUID and name, right? And then there's values, the UUID is this, and the name is Agatha Angry. So what we did is we printed out Agatha, Agatha Angry, uh, and then we also printed out the array length of 127. So what it's saying is there's 127 of these objects in this array, and what we did is we grabbed the first one and we took the name out of it. Okay, so let's keep humming along here. Um, I realized uh, I, I made a couple of mistakes here when I pumped that into uh, the A value, and this is spelt incorrectly, so my apologies. For anyone that has OCD, you're probably um, ringing off the... Your brain cells are ringing off the hook there. <laughs> Sorry, triggered. Um, okay, so this was uh, first array value and then space, and then uh, array length. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so what I'm thinking here is really, to use this correctly, we should be uh, pulling all the values from uh, the voice response that we got back, identifying the unique values on the name, and then providing those names to the user in the form of a drop-down list, the user could pick the name, and then based on that name, we would then look for the unique values of emotions that are tied to that user, allow the user to, uh, to pick uh, that value from a drop-down list, and then ultimately with those two values selected, go back to the array and select the appropriate UUID. This tutorial is a little bit long, so if people are really interested in that, I can create that separate and, and show you that functionality. We could probably do that in in 10 or 15 minutes, a short tutorial. Um, but this one, we'll just leave it as is. We'll pull one value out. So we'll get, instead of this being name, we'll instead pull the UUID of the first value. And we'll store that uh, in a, a string variable. We'll just call um, UUID uh, response. Change this to a string, and then compile and save. And yeah, what we'll do is we'll return this value and we'll stick it to 
UUID response. Oops, that should be a set. And we can get rid of all this print string garbage. Do uh, we don't need the field names anymore? That was just for demo. And this is all that we'll do. So we will. Uh, and one thing that I should be doing with the arrays, we don't need the string either. Get rid of that. This will actually be a really simple function. Um, one thing that we should do when we're getting any array is we should make sure that the array isn't empty. So um, let's do this. Do, 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 do. And we should be saying essentially branch, or we can say greater than zero, uh, greater than, yeah. And we want it greater than zero. And essentially we'll only run this code if this is true. So then we'll do a branch. And we'll say if this condition is true, then um, run that code. And we'll go and we'll do that for our other arrays too, right? So um, that's some of these errors that are coming up. So if I opened up the message log, it's probably going to say, um, access none, right? So we want to get rid of those errors. So we're sometimes running it and the array is empty and then we're asking it to uh, print things out of the array or whatnot. So this will just make sure that the length is greater before we actually execute any code on top of that array. Cool. Okay, so now that we've got gotten the um, the UD, UUID response, we can actually use this UUID response in our second option here. Uh, this was our get. So really what we should have done is we should have done this one as number two and then this one as number three. And maybe we should just fix that right now because that's an easy fix. Let's do it. And it makes sense from a um, numerical order perspective, right? We're going to do the authentication. We're going to get a, our lists of voices. And then number three in the order is we are going to then um, select the speech file that we want from uh, Replica. Okay, cool. So yeah, so press one, authenticate, press two, get the voice um, stored in the UUID, and then three, Instruct a JSON. Uh, we don't need this hello string. I don't know why that's in there. Let's get rid of that. And then let's let's fill in this URL. So if we went back to replica, um, we're using the speech one here. So, whoops. We want this URL, which we should be creating. Right, that's why it's not populated. We've got this URL. Uh, we need the speaker ID, which now we have one, right? Speaker ID equals UUID response. And we should be able to pump that in here. Oh, yeah, this. Right. So let's get rid of this then. Delete that. Um, get rid of this pin. Uh, oh, yeah, in number two. Um, and this should be set replica speaker ID instead. And then we can delete this. Yes. Set. Replica speaker ID. Here we go. Boom. Okay, and then we come back here, leave that. And here we can print out uh, the replica 
speaker ID if we need to. We shouldn't need to now that we fixed it. I'll save play. Okay, let's see this. One, two, three. There, cool. So we got um, a, a valid response back. Uh, we can get rid of this. This is just for troubleshooting. Boom. One, two, three, there. So there's our response back. Okay, so now what we wanna do is we want to uh, get the file back. So it gave us a response, but we don't actually have a, um, we don't actually have a, um, a file captured. So that's sort of the next step in this uh, tutorial is we'll grab the file. Okay, so yeah, now we, we want to make the code to handle this response and get the file downloader. Um, so let's put in this piece of work. So I believe, I'm just going to look at my old code here. Uh, process the URL, yes, uh, JSON get request. Okay, yeah, out of here, get rid of this. And what we can do is we can Download file to storage. Okay. And essentially what we want to do is we want to uh, get some objects to do that. So we can get the response object. And in the response object, we can get a string field. And you saw when I had it all printed out before, there was a field called uh, URL. That's what we want. And we also um, then want to take this uh, URL and we want to pump it into our download file storage. And then we want to, can, whoops, sorry, my apologies. We want to convert to absolute path. Okay, and the file save directory, I don't think that we created one of these yet, but let's do this. Let's just say file save directory, and that's fine for a string. And then this is where we're going to choose where does the um, file get saved to in, uh, yeah, get that, we'll compile save, that's fine for now. And this, uh, you can just put your path. So here I'll just put D colon for now. I'll pump that into this. And then we'll put that as our save path. We'll put the timeout as a minute. And then um, we can use a couple of these uh, event objects to monitor what we're doing. So let's just clean this up a little bit. Okay. And uh, I think this is pretty straightforward, right? So basically on the response, get the object, get the string field, which is the URL from the response from the API, create a file save path, and then stick it in this download um, file to storage. And then we have to basically uh, create some events here, right? So download, pro uh, whoops, I want to go um, custom event. And then I want to go download, download progress is one. And then on complete custom event, do that. And we'll call this uh, down, download complete. Okay, and this one I'm actually gonna stick over here because this is our happy path. And the download progress. So this one, what it does is it'll return bytes received and the content length. And so what we could do if we wanted to is we could print out, uh, and this is how you would use a status bar, but essentially for our purposes, because we're not doing any GUI, um, we can basically print out the status as 
the file is being downloaded. So if we um, took this out and hmm, how do we want to do this? Maybe we just do it this way. We can go uh, append and at the top we can say per percentage download complete complete okay colon space and then what we can do is we can pump these values in so what do i want to do here i think i want to convert this to um a float and i want to convert this to a float Okay, now I have these both as floats, which is good. And then I want to uh, divide one float by the other. So let's do this uh, float over float. We'll drop that into here. And so essentially we're saying the amount of bytes received divided by the entire content length is going to give us a uh, percentage, right? That's all that we're doing here. And then we can pump that in here, right? So we can have this stack and have this uh, append. And then essentially it'll say your, your content is a total amount of bytes. And then the bytes received at a time in place, we will print that um, out to the screen. Um, and I'll show you how that runs in a second. And then we should um, put this a little bit longer. So let's just say this displays for 10 seconds and we change the color to like a dark green seems appropriate for this type of thing. How do we get a nice dark green? There we go. Right. Okay. And then what else do we want to do? Okay. So we want to figure out the results here, right? So there is this thing called switch on I don't know, I'm not going to try reading that out switch on e download to storage result. Um, and then basically, these are all the different results that you can have. So you can have a successful download. So let's print out a string download was successful. Cool. Um, you can have the download fail. Print string. Uh, uh, that one can be two seconds because it's quick. The fail. Oh, come on, work with me here. All right, whatever. We're going to put down load failed. And we're going to put that in red because red is bad. Sure. Uh, and then we're going to let this sit a little longer. And then um, the uh, print string. And we're going to say saving of file failed. Okay. And then same thing. We are going to put that in red. Red. And we'll display that for a little bit longer. And uh, that's about it. Um, then we have the file on our computer. So let's just test this out. What happens if I compile? Nothing. Okay, it's good. Okay, so let's see if that worked. Okay, so our fail saved because our save directory needs a name. So let's call this realtech.wave. File save, and then let's run this. One, two, three. Our percentage of download completed, and then uh, we should have a file. Uh, we'll have to troubleshoot that later, but let's just see on our D drive, 
yeah, we now have this real tech file. If we play it. This is a test out to replica. This is a test out to replica. Cool. Is that what we wrote in our, um, this is a test out to replica. Sweet. So now if we change this, this is a change out to replica. This is a change out to replica. Okay, now that we have the file loaded on your machine, uh, what we need to do is we need to run that audio um, and import that file uh, into uh, Unreal. Uh, I forgot earlier when I had you download the plugins, uh, I forgot there's a third plugin we need and it's this audio analysis tools plugin, uh, also free. So just go ahead and grab that one. In my project here, we're going to go audio analysis. We're going to enable it, restart. Okay, once we're restarted. Okay. And then we're going to go here. And off of our new pin here, we're going to create runtime audio importer. We are going to um, bind event to on result. It all start feeling somewhat similar now. Import audio from file. Okay. On on result. Event. Oh, sorry. Create. Whoa. Create custom. I don't know. Let me custom. There we go. Add custom event. And there we go. On result. Import audio file. We are going to switch, switch on ET transcoding, transcoding. Uh, maybe I need to do it here. Switch to E transcoding status. Yep. Um, this. We want to um, play 2D sound. We want Yep. Okay, the file path needs to be the file save directory. The target is your return value here. That's fine. Determine format automatically. Play the 2D sound. Yeah, should be good. Let's give that a go. And then we can clean this all up after. Make sure it works. So let's try this. Oh, let's get new audio so we know that we have the right one. Um, This is a change out to replica. What? Why is it getting the old 
file. Let's try that again. One, authenticated. Two, authentication. Oh, there's that. Three. Oh, there. I didn't wait for that, I guess, last time. And then four. The tutorial is now over. Okay, so that does wrap it up. I did go back and I added some error coding um, to make sure that all of the error messaging and um, the errors were handled. So I put in uh, print strings to handle any of the error outputs. Uh, so you can take a look at those. Uh, I did decide to print out the get response content as string because that would sort of uh, cheaply handle our error messaging on the failure uh, accounts without having to you know, create a whole second line of code. I thought that was reasonable for what we were doing here. And uh, I put in some uh, error checking on the length of an array to make sure that we weren't processing on any of our arrays uh, if they didn't have content in them. Uh, so you'll find that that has been included in each section and that's it. So um, thanks for following along. If you want access to the project files, as I mentioned earlier, you can get that uh, from my Patreon page on my channel up at the top right. That will take you to the Patreon page where I will upload all of these files. You can contribute whatever amount you want. Just be aware that uh, when you do put in an amount, it is putting in a monthly charge. Um, so just recognize that that's recurring. And if you don't want it to be a one-time thing, then make sure to cancel um, with Patreon right away. Or, you know, happy to have, you know, a couple of bucks support um, for the work that I'm doing. So uh, whatever you choose to do, we're just trying to make this accessible for everybody and just cover off uh, some of my minor costs here for hosting and, and doing that sort of stuff. Um, that's it. So uh, officially, let's run the project and show you how it's working with the error coding. What we want to do is we want to delete the file if we have one, run this, hit four, failure, three, failure, two, failure. And then if we run it in correct order, here's the final output. The tutorial is now over. And now the tutorial is. The tutorial is now over. It is.